This video is going to describe a new procedure that we've been doing to augment ulnar intrinsic motor function in situations where we anticipate some but less than ideal motor recovery. We'll be talking about first the Guillain's Canal release. This ensures that we have the deep motor branch completely decompressed so there's no block to regeneration and ulnar intrinsic functional recovery. So this is the right hand. Again, I'm sitting in the ulnar side or in the axilla, I call it. And the first part of this reverse and aside or RETS procedure to augment ulnar function is to open up Guillain's canal. I make my incision ulnar to the thenar crease, about six to eight millimeters and then I use a Brunner incision across the wrist. As I'm coming through the soft tissue, I'll be looking for the potential for a cutaneous branch in the distal one-third of this Palmer incision. It comes off of the ulnar nerve and gives some sensation to the skin. It's there approximately 20-30% of the time. Now as I come through Guillain's Canal and release Guillain's Canal, the first step is to open up Guillain's Canal and identify the neurovascular bundle. I also specifically release the fascia proximal to the wrist crease, which in most people is quite thick and compressive. Microbipolar cautery is used to divide the uh, palmaris bravus and the overlying fascia. I'm on the lookout for that cutaneous nerve. And you can see the neurovascular bundle below. I think that's the little cutaneous nerve right there and it's a decent size so unlike trying to find distal branches of the palmar cutaneous using this ulnar incision this ulnar cutaneous branch is very visible when it's present. The Guillain's Canal release does really two things for this operation it helps us to identify the deep motor branch so we can follow that back proximally and make sure that we're innervating the deep motor branch with the RETS procedure or reverse and aside procedure from the anterior interosseous nerve. And it also decompresses that deep motor branch. You can see the fascia that I was talking about that's proximal to the wrist crease. So you can't get this really without making your incision more proximally. And as the nerve regenerates, it will slow at this compressive point, and the motor axons will slow as they go around the compressive point at the tendinous leading edge of the hypothenar muscles. So that fascia is nicely released. And now we're going to sweep the entire neurovascular bundle medially. So this is our next step. Just sweep the neurovascular bundle medially or ulnarly or towards you, the surgeon sitting in the axilla side of the table. Now the next step is to feel the hook of the hammock and this will quickly orient you. So I palpate the hook of the hammock. I'm going to mark that with some marking pen ink. And this is a little uh, trick for localizing where the deep motor branch is going to be. Now the next thing is we look. We look to see where we no longer see the crossing fascia or muscle bands of the hypothenar muscles. 
and then detach the muscles and the fascia from its attachment at that level of the hook of the hamate. So you see the hypothenar muscles and then when you see the proximal leading edge that's where you're going to find the deep motor branch. And you actually don't see the deep motor branch until you decompress it. Here's bits of tendinous fascial tissue within the hypothenar muscles that will compress that nerve. And as nerves regenerate, they slow at known areas of nerve compression. And decompressing the nerve at these potential entrapment points will give you better regeneration and better functional recovery. And you can see below these hypothenar muscles, all the way across here is this fascial band, and right below it, the deep motor branch of the ulnar nerve supplying the intrinsic muscles. In my experience, this specific decompression that I'm showing you here is frequently not done when talented hand surgeons decompress Guillain's canal. They do the superficial part that we just saw, but they don't get this deep motor intrinsic release. And I think it's because you actually have to know how to do this before you actually get the cue of where's the nerve. And you can see below the intrinsic motor branch is coming into vision. And you can see how it relates to that hook of hamate anatomical marker. And I've released that all the way along to the flexor tendon to the small finger. There's the deep motor branch sliding on through. So as these axons regenerate, they will have an open door to the intrinsic muscles. Now we're going to do the reverse and decide transfer of the anterior interosseous nerve to the deep motor fascicular group of the ulnar nerve. I'm going to call the reverse and decide RETS. I'm going to call it the RETS repair or the RETS transfer. So this part of the procedure is straightforward. We're going to just identify the ulnar nerve in the distal forearm. And in general, the endocyte repair from the anterior interosseous nerve to the ulnar nerve without tension is going to be about 9 centimeters proximal to the wrist crease. So your incision in the forearm is going to be a little longer than that in order to facilitate that transfer. And here I'm just following out a cutaneous nerve and, and protecting that. Remember this patient has partial ulnar intrinsic function and so these little cutaneous, ulnar cutaneous nerves are um, protected distal branches of the medial antibrachycutaneous nerve because there is some function in them. This procedure as you can see is done under tourniquet control and to add this RETS procedure to the decompression is probably another 45 minutes. So 45 minutes to increase the probability of ulnar intrinsic function. Now if you know you're not going to get any ulnar intrinsic function, then you could do an end-to-end. -end. But in this situation we're augmenting or supercharging. Now, as I said, the repair is going to be about 9 centimeters proximal to the wrist. You need to first find the leading edge of the pronator quadratus. And you can see here that I've decided I need to extend my incision more proximally because I can't see the proximal leading edge of the pronator quadratus as I took a quick look uh, from that distal, smaller, shorter incision. To find the pronator quadratus, what I recommend is reflecting all the flexor tendons towards the radial side of the wrist. Everything moves radial, and then that takes you straight down to the pronator quadratus. So don't try to find the pronator quadratus. 
by barreling through these uh, flexor tendons and flexor muscles. Just retract them all to the radial side of the forearm. A deep down curve retractor. You can see a little bit of the pronator quadratus. And now I need to go and find the leading proximal border of the pronator. In the middle of the pronator quadratus is going to be the anterior interosseous nerve and the vessel with it. And I use uh, microbipolar cautery. The anterior interosseous nerve is going to divide in the mid portion of the pronator quadratus. And that is where I'm going to stop the dissection because I want to have all the motor axons I can get in my transfer. There's between 500 and 700 or so nerve fibers in the anterior interosseous nerve. There's about 12 or 1400 nerve fibers in the deep motor branch of the ulnar nerve. So you can see there is a mismatch, but the motor fibers in the anterior interosseous nerve are better used in this patient in the ulnar nerve than in the pronator quadratus. So we take care not to cause bleeding in here. We don't want to have to chase this at the end of the procedure in a, in a deep hole, and we will be cauterizing any small branches of that anterior interosseous vessel as need be. You can see the anterior interosseous nerve uh, coming into vision now. And this location is really consistent. And the branching point's very consistent. The motor end plates of muscles are located in the middle of the muscle, in the middle of the muscle belly. So it will start to branch up to innervate those motor end plates in the middle of the pronator quadratus. If you go past that point, then you are losing motor axons. And of course, the very distal part of the anterior interosseous is articular to the joint. So you can see some of the little branches coming now in the middle of the pronator quadratus. You can see the anterior interosseous nerve is branching up into several motor branches that are going into the middle of the muscle belly of the pronator to innervate those motor end plates. And I'm going to take those uh, branches. Now you can see that the size diameter, the cross-sectional diameter, is larger here in the branches than it is proximally in the trunk. And you can use that for size matching in any of these nerve transfers. The farther you follow the donor nerve out, the more branches you're going to get and the broader the cross-sectional diameter of that nerve will be. So that will help you figure out your size match with some of these nerve transfers and other nerve transfers. So now I'm following and mobilizing the anterior interosseous nerve proximally so I can swing it over to the ulnar nerve. The next step is going to be to figure out what part, of that, what part of that ulnar nerve is motor. So the first thing to do is identify the dorsocutaneous branch, which is down there. That's sensory, of course. And right adjacent to it on the main ulnar nerve is the motor. And then farther away is the sensory. So the motor is sandwiched, if you will between the sensory component of the ulnar nerve to the palmar aspect of the fourth and fifth di digits and the dorsocutaneous branch of the ulnar nerve. Or, if you don't see the dorsocutaneous branch of the ulnar nerve, if you're still distal to that, then the ulnar motor is going to be on the ulnar side of the ulnar nerve and the sensory portion of the ulnar nerves on the radial side. So that's dorsocutaneous, motor, and sensory motor, dorsocutaneous motor, dorsocutaneous motor sensory, motor, dorsocutaneous. That's very consistent. That topography is quite consistent. You can see this little fatty streak here that delineates the smaller motor fascicular group 
almost a cleavage plane. See that cleavage plane right there? That's the motor and it's slightly smaller than the sensory main part of the ulnar nerve. So I'm bringing that anterior interosseous nerve to show you now where is it going to go into that nerve without tension. Of course more proximal, less tension. If you pull it more distal there's too much tension and you don't want any tension on your repair. You can use micro pickups to tap across the main ulnar nerve and the micro pickups will drop into the fascicular cleavage plane between the sensory and the motor components of the ulnar nerve. And the motor is about 40 percent, the sensory is about 60 percent. Now I'm just going to clean up those uh, distal branches to give me a cleaner end for the repair. That's the motor, dorsocutaneous is in my pickups. I'm looking at that cleavage plane now and I'm going to open up the main ulnar nerve so I can really confirm the motor component. And that motor component is, there's the cleavage plane, that's the motor component. The dorsocutaneous is in the pickups at the top of the screen. I'm just teasing off that dorsocutaneous. The motor sits sandwiched between that dorsocutaneous and the main sensory to the palm fourth and fifth digits. There's the cleavage plane. It's a nice easy cleavage plane. The size of the motor is about one-third. The size of the main sensory is two-thirds. Now you can use uh, pickups and your loops to visually neural ice distally in the hand to confirm that that is indeed the motor fascicular group that we identified around the hook of the hamate. And in some situations where there may be some intrinsic function, you can actually stimulate that motor group and you'll see that it gives contraction of the intrinsic muscles in the hand and the other two sensory parts don't. So this is um, dorsocutaneous, the motor below and the sensory above. And you can see that one-third, two-third size. Now you can see we don't do this neurolysis until, until we decide where we're going to put that anterior interosseous nerve, otherwise it's a waste of time. So we bring that anterior interosseous nerve over, like I did a few minutes ago. I decide this is where I'm going to do my repair, and so this is where I'm going to do my neurolysis. So the first thing is bring your donor over to determine where you're going to go into the ulnar nerve without tension. That same principle applies to an end-to-end -end anterior interosseous to deep motor branch ulnar nerve. Otherwise, if you go more distally, you're going to have to use a graft, and that defeats to some degree the uh, success and the utility of this operation because you'd rather not have to have the two repair sites. Also, it takes more time to put the graft in. So going pro distally is tense, going proximally is looser. Nice and loose when I go proximally. And if I put that repair distally, it would be too tense. It wouldn't work. Now I've put my AIN RETS repair in with a stitch. I have moved the wrist around and I just want to make sure it's sitting there with no problem. So a single stitch held it right in position. You can see there's no tension on that at all. That is the end of that.